All right, the Lord be with you. Thank you, Sheena, for ringing that bell very loudly, making sure we are all up. Thank you. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, Sheena has been up for the past how many hours? Well, I did sleep for like four, I think. She slept. She had a, 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 a what do you call it, a lock-in uh, at the middle school. So uh, she came straight from the lock-in to here. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Sheena, for being here. All right, folks, uh, good morning. It's good to be back after uh, my time in uh, North Carolina. Uh, my, all of my coursework for the semester has been turned in, so I'm free uh, for until at least August or September. Um, so my dissertation proposal has been turned in. Uh, and uh, yeah, I might actually do some pleasure reading or something over the summer. Oh, that'd be nice. So good to be back here with you all. A couple quick announcements before we get going uh, this day. Uh, just a reminder that we do have a session meeting this Tuesday at 630 at the Mendenhall's house uh, out in Versailles. Uh, next week, we will have a reception after, immediately after worship um, for Jeff Shaver to give gratitude for him for his um, five years with us as our youth director, but he's also been with us in a variety of other capacities, preaching, filling in for the pulpit uh, many times. Uh, he was uh, a pastoral intern back in 2019 uh, for his fulfillment, uh, partial fulfillment of the requirements to uh, uh, help him as he goes along the ordination process. Um, so we give Thanks for Jeff and the many different hats that he's worn over the past five years. So again, that'll be immediately after worship um, next week. A couple of pastoral care uh, things to keep in mind. I have had a couple surgeries. Um, uh, let's see, Richard Schaefer, I believe, had his wrist surgery last week uh, and is recovering. So uh, please keep uh, Richard and Janice in your prayers. Also, Erica Horn is having her knee replacement surgery uh, this upcoming Wednesday, so we keep Erica in our uh, prayers for a, a, a successful procedure and a quick recovery. Um, and the only other uh, pastoral care thing is just to mention uh, the folks that are grieving up in Buffalo after that horrible shooting uh, yesterday in a predominantly black neighborhood. Uh, in, in Buffalo, New York. I've been ordained eight years now and far too many times I've had to stand in this pulpit and in others the day after um, uh, racially motivated uh, shootings and just want to reiterate that when we as a congregation declare ourselves an anti-racist congregation, um, that's, this is important work. Uh, we may be a pretty small congregation, and some might think that the work we do is insignificant. I, I make the case that it is not, uh, that the work that we do to proclaim a gospel that is antithetical to the kind of um, racist, anti-immigrant um, ideology that the shooter um, professed, that this is important work that we do, even in our own small way as the people who are Beaumont Presbyterian Church. So we pray uh, with and for the folks um, who died yesterday up in Buffalo. Um, we pray that not only our work may, uh, may just be in our prayers, but also in our, in, our, um, in our advocacy for better gun, better, stricter gun laws in this country and to continue to fight the forces of racism and anti-immigrant nativism in this country. So today... Uh, as we mourn with the people up in Buffalo, let's rededicate ourselves um, to be an anti-racist congregation. Again, it's not as simple thing as being a racist congregation or an anti-racist congregation. We remind ourselves that it is a spectrum, uh, that it is a lifelong commitment both as individuals and as institutions um, to be anti-racist. So we rededicate ourselves to that this day, and we'll keep them in our prayers later on. Any other announcements that your pastor may have forgotten this day? Hmm? Oh, yes, and continued prayers um, for, for Wayne Gebb as he continues to recover from his uh, prostatectomy. Uh, that was last week. Thank you, Sheena, I've forgotten that. All right, friends, let us uh, breathe, as is our practice, and then Sheena will lead us in our prayer of the day and Lydia in our prelude. 
Friends, breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. Breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. And finally, breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies for yourself and for others as well. Friends, let us worship God. Let us pray. Surprising God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you make all things new. Long ago, you called your church to a love beyond all social and cultural differences and gave them the gift of your Holy Spirit to open their hearts to enact such love. Give us that same spirit of openness that we too might discern new directions in our day for your dream to reconcile and heal all creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand in body or spirit and join with me in our call to worship. Alleluia! Christ is alive. Let all the people praise him. Let all creation sing with joy. Alleluia! Come, let us worship the holy God. Our first hymn is number 14 for the
trusting in the love of God to make all things new, let us confess our sin to God and our neighbor. God of mercy, your command to love one another across all differences opens us to new horizons, yet we often respond with fear and judgment that hinders your goal for humanity. Forgive our sins, we pray, and give us a true repentance that leads to life for all creation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear the renewing waters of God's mercies. Friends, God's promises are trustworthy and true. Our sins are forgiven. So be at peace to serve the Lord, and may you always be known by your love. Alleluia. Amen. may be seated. If any children would like to join Edwina for godly play, she is waiting. Let us pray. Oh, God of promise, your word made flesh and Jesus Christ is trustworthy and true. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may it rise up in us this day like a gift from the spring of the water of life to refresh our thirsty souls. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture is Psalm 148. Please join me in reading. Praise the Lord. Praise Praise the the Lord Lord from the heavens. Praise Praise him him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord For his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face.
Amen. Thank you, Jillian and Lydia, for that beautiful offering. A sweet, sweet spirit indeed. Friends, we turn again to Scripture. Uh, this, uh, this is the period in the Revised Common Lectionary after Easter where instead of an Old Testament reading, they, we uh, switch to the book of Acts. Uh, so today's reading comes to us from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Let us listen again for what God is saying to God's church. <clears throat> Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision there was something like a large sheet, a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air, and I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean, has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and to not make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gifts that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Friends, holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You ate with them? Peter paused before answering that question. He knew that what he had done was unconventional at best and straight up heretical at worst. Peter had been raised a good Jew, knowing the difference between that which was clean and, and that which was unclean. Growing up, 
he most certainly followed the strict dietary laws of the Pentateuch, laws that were intended to identify uh, the Jews as God's chosen people. The following of these laws, my dear friends, was not trivial. It was a practice that brought meaning and identity to a people who had entered into a covenant with a loving God. Those of us who are Christian, we have similar things that give us meaning and identity, if, if in different ways. But Peter, it's not just about the dietary laws. Peter was also circumcised. Circumcision was the mark of a Jewish male. It symbolized the covenant established between God and God's people. It was a very important thing. Done on the eighth day after birth, the Jewish male was circumcised to represent uh, his entrance into the Jewish faith. So the Jews' obedience to dietary laws and the following of the practice of circumcision were two of the most important ways in which they identified themselves as a people. Simply put, these were the ways that the Jewish folks ordered their worldview. And Peter was a product of that worldview, but something had happened to him a few weeks prior that brought that, uh, that worldview into question. He had a trippy dream, friends. Peter was taking a nice long snooze one afternoon when that vision came to him in the form of a dream. He saw something like this weird sheet being lowered from heaven with all kinds of animals, clean and unclean. And we hear that voice, get up, Peter, have at it. Here's a, this wonderful smorgasbord in front of you. But uh, Peter doesn't take the bait. He answers uh, correctly to that question, at least in how he's been taught says, no way, Lord, not falling for that one. Nothing profane or unclean has ever, uh, has ever been eaten by me. But then we have that really uh, prophetic word from heaven that says uh, what God has called clean, uh, don't call profane. And of course, this exchange is repeated not once, not twice, but a good biblical three times just to emphasize how important it is. And as soon as he wakes up, Peter gets visited by three strangers who take him to another person's house, a person who we can presume uh, to be Gentile along with the rest of their family. And normally it would be blasphemous for Peter to hang out with such a crowd. He, being a Jew, would not be uh, legally allowed to break bread with Gentiles. He was circumcised. They weren't. He followed certain dietary restrictions. They didn't. But that dream changes all that. I wonder, have you ever had a dream that changes things for you? Well, it certainly did Peter. Because he realized that the, spirit, that the spirit that led him to have that divine dream was the same spirit that was calling him to minister and to with those people, right? That moniker we put on people who are different than us. In this case, for Peter, the Gentiles. And that's what he did. Peter allowed himself to be changed by a dream. He opened himself to the work of the Holy Spirit, and he ministered to the Gentiles in that area, setting a precedent for this, uh, this new movement that they called the Way, this adolescent Christianity, and this precedent some found to be a threat. And so the word spread. And pretty soon, everyone was talking about how Peter was dining with and preaching to Gentiles. Sooner or later, inevitably, Peter was going to have to explain himself. And so the other apostles and the believers corner Peter and ask him that question, you ate with them? Peter replied by telling the story that's recalled in the passage that we just read. Peter doesn't reply with a yes or a no. He doesn't give a detailed theological treatise or argument or mission statement. He simply tells them about his dream and testifies with what happened to him. He told them of the dream with that trippy sheet thing and the clean and the unclean animals, and he tells ultimately of his gospel experience, his, his, uh, his change. The book of Acts, which we are reading from a good bit this month, really is this ultimately the story of the growing concentric circles of Christianity in the early post-resurrection world. What began with a few women 
at an empty tomb a month ago on Easter Sunday is now becoming uh, this subversive, unstoppable movement led by none other than our good friend Peter. Their numbers are growing, and with that growth come certain questions that they didn't have to worry about before. Now, the question of inclusivity is becoming an issue. Frankly put, the Christians are beginning to ask themselves, well, in this new movement that we're doing, who's in and who's out? Such is not really a, an important question when you're nothing more than a small ragtag group of, of men and women and a Messiah. But now that the movement is growing into thousands, tens of thousands, the growing church is having to define itself. The question of identity is now on the table. And this is not a new development in Christianity, and here we are 2,000 years later having the same uh, type of discussion. For decades, our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, has struggled about whether or not LGBT persons were in or out. We've argued, really since the 60s or 70s, um, we've argued, we've fought, and ultimately our denomination has split. Several conservative factions of our denomination split into their own denominations where they declared heterosexual as in and homosexual as out. This schism was and is very painful and it is very personal to me. My home, con I, some of y'all know, I've probably brought this up before, my home congregation, the faithful people who I love, who raised me in the faith uh, and led me to become the preacher and the pastor that stands before you today, uh, they split over this very issue about 10 years ago when I was in seminary. The majority of my home congregation, I'd say probably a good 85% or so, left the denomination to start a new church uh, in the EPC, the Evangelical Church, um, where they don't ordain LGBT persons and they very rarely ordain women. So I know the pain that comes from drawing that line. And also, we need to be holding our Methodist siblings uh, in our prayers because the United Methodist Church is in the middle of that exact same conversation, although for them it's even more uh, complex than ours because our conversation on LGBT inclusion was just among our denomination, which is in just this nation of the United States of America, whereas the United Methodist Church is a global denomination. So for them, it's, it's an even more complex issue. So we hold our Methodist siblings uh, in our prayers. And I will say, although you all know where I am on this, uh, on, on this side of the issue and where this congregation has uh, placed itself, that there were and are still faithful people on both sides of that issue. And like many people who in Peter's time thought that circumcision and dietary laws were necessary to be faithful Christians, there are still many Presbyterians and Methodists who believe that same-sex marriage is just, is just cannot be held in faithful tension with the biblical text. But as you know, after many decades of arguing and, and, and going back and forth, Eventually, a growing number of Presbyterians in our denomination came to understand that the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. Stories were told and shared, uh, like Peter's stories today, about the faithful deeds of those people and about how the gospel can and is wonderfully proclaimed through those people and that God is calling us to no longer make those distinctions. Uh, the folks uh, who we've partnered with uh, at Woven Church are a perfect example of how this tension can really be lived into in really beautiful ways. And it was testimonies that changed hearts and minds. Stories about relationships that made the difference. Stories like what Peter gave in today's passage. And I will say the church looks different. Now, that's what happens when the Spirit moves. The church begins to look different, and that can bring along with it fear. That can bring along with it anxiety. The church, thanks to dreams like Peter's, welcomes different voices and explores different ways to understand that same gospel. And it's, it's important to understand that Peter's inclusion of the Gentiles was not without precedent. Peter was just continuing the ministry of Jesus, who made a career out of challenging the status quo and ministering, not just to, but with the other, whoever that other represented. 
Jesus, too, was a circumcised Jew. He knew, uh, too, that the laws, uh, he knew the laws, and he followed the heart of the laws, but Jesus saw something beautiful, something worth redeeming in people that society shunned. Jesus, in being perfectly human and perfectly divine, had this gift of seeing the holiness in people of all kinds. And we are likewise called to see the holiness in all people, especially for those who might make us a little uncomfortable, especially in people that might be a little bit different from us. That's a challenging message for the conservatives among us, and you know what? It is equally challenging for the progressives among us as well. And this passage, this passage that preaches a radical inclusivity, begs uh, some really uncomfortable questions, questions that must be reckoned with these days when there are so many competing ideologies that argue over the inherent dignity and worth of human beings regarding their race, their sexuality, their, their gender expression. So I'll, I will raise for us a very uncomfortable question this day. We, like so many other congregations, say all are welcome, right? If you're watching online right now, at the bottom of your screen, at some point during this live broadcast, you saw the hashtag, all are welcome. My question is this, do we mean that? The question I have is, do we really know what that means? And an even more provocative question could be this, is it even possible to truly welcome all people? want us to sit in the uncomfortableness of that question for just a second. And this is what I'm getting at. I'm, I'm not trying to provide answers. I'm trying to raise some really important questions that congregations these days are wrestling with. So for the sake of argument, let me use a rather extreme example. So almost exactly a year ago, this congregation um, joined More Light Presbyterians, right? Which means that we've made a public commitment to being a space where our LGBT siblings are both safe and celebrated, right? Next month, we're planning, uh, uh, we're in the beginning stages of planning a joint worship service with our friends at Woven Church to have a bit of a panel about uh, what LGBT inclusivity in the church looks like. Say for the sake of argument, that a member of Westboro Baptist Church decides to join us for that worship service. Do we all know who Westboro Baptist Church is? I use that word church loosely. They're more of a cult than a church, but they're this uh, group of folks out in Kansas that are known to picket and protest, well, really everybody. They're very, very much homophobic, um, and they uh, are known to go and pick at everything from soldiers' burials to pop stars to churches. Um, they're, they're really, they're a hate group is, is what they are. So imagine at this joint worship service we have to celebrate LGBT inclusion in the church that a protester from Westboro Baptist Church walks in that door back there and he is wearing clothing decked out in homophobic slurs and is holding a picket sign saying God hates, I'm not going to say the word because I'm not going to utter that word from the pulpit. Would that person be welcome at Beaumont Presbyterian Church? Could we welcome him while simultaneously remaining faithful to our commitment to being a safe space for LGBT persons where they're free from such harassment? You see what I'm saying? Like, this, is, this is really tricky stuff when you get into it. I, I, my hope would be maybe that in the very unlikely chance that that happened, that we could find some way to insist that, that, person, that while that person is welcome, that his homophobic ideology isn't. Maybe we could say, look, you're welcome, but you, your picket sign isn't. You're welcome, but you're going to have to change that shirt. You're welcome, but we're going to assign an elder to observe him for the entirety of the service to make sure he doesn't take advantage of our hospitality to harass anyone. Some folks could make the argument that even with those measures, that our welcoming of that person would endanger our commitment to the safety of our LGBT uh, siblings. Others could make the opposite argument. Uh, maybe they can make the argument that the only way that people like that have a change of heart is if they see the humanity, the dignity, and the beauty of LGBT persons, which would be an opportunity robbed of that person if we turned him away at the door. 
Others might go on to say that we're hindering his free speech. Do you see how quickly this gets dicey? The complexity of radical inclusivity brings to the table, the, the complexity that ra radical inclusivity brings to the table explains why the church has literally been arguing about this for 2,000 years. And the argument isn't going away anytime soon, especially not in the vitriol of our current political discourse. And so how do we navigate these tricky waters? Well, I think that today's passage gives us at least three pointers. Number one, we must understand that the Holy Spirit is constantly on the move and that we can never rely on what we traditionally thought was right to always remain the same. Such is a hallmark of Reformed theology, right? We are both Reformed and what? Being Reformed, right? Number two, discernment is a communal exercise. This too is a hallmark of Reformed theology. We trust the Holy Spirit to guide our discernment as we wrestle with these issues together. Does this make uh, such an exercise sometimes difficult, angsty, and prolonged? You betcha. But we trust that there is wisdom when we discern this together. When we do this together, uh, that there's a wisdom to be found that isn't found when we outsource that discernment to an individual or even to one pastor. And then question number three. Always, always, always ask ourselves this question. Is this an act of love? It's a simple question, but a deceptively tricky one. For example, some might say it's an act of love to turn away the Westboro Baptist Church protester because in doing so, it protects the safety and the well-being of our LGBT members. Others might say that it's actually a more faithful act of love to welcome the Westboro Baptist Church protester with certain safety provisions, of course, because that would counter hate with hospitality. What do we mean when we say all are welcome? Would we welcome someone who espouses the racist, anti-immigrant um, ideologies that promote, that convinced that shooter up in Buffalo to do that horrible, horrible act yesterday? I don't know. But we wrestle with this together as a community because these are tricky questions for tricky times. So this passage, I think, is a really beautiful reminder that we are constantly called to ask ourselves, what is the right act of love for this moment? What would Jesus want us to do to protect the sacredness, the inherent dignity of every human being? Perhaps this passage is just telling us that in that time of discernment, we need to keep ourselves out of the way of the Holy Spirit in, in all that we do to never, ever hinder what God is doing in the world. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, may all of us, God's beloved people, say, Amen. All right, folks, our next hymn is number 288, Spirit of the Living God. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. Friends, let's sing that again a cappella, shall we? Speak.
Amen and amen. I invite you now to proclaim with me the faith story that we have inherited using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Our prayer this day will be uh, responsive. So when I say, O God of love, I invite you to respond by saying, raise us to new life in Christ. Again, when I say, O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. So let us pray together saying, O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. Let us pray. For the well-being of your creation, we pray that we may promote its ability to offer praise to you, gracious God, through spacious skies, bountiful seas, verdant lands, and precious creatures great and small. O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the life of the church, that our generous witness may broaden your table as all find a place to live and grow in love. O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the welfare of your world, that all leaders and people, young and old, will strive to live together in harmony while serving the common good. O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For all who suffer any violence, pain, or grief, we especially pray for the African-American community in Buffalo as they mourn. We pray for all of those who are affected. We pray for African-American mothers and fathers who fear for the safety of their children when they leave the house. And for all persons of color and immigrants who have been so harmed and traumatized by racist rhetoric in this country, an anti-immigrant sentiment. We name that as sin, and we ask that there would be healing, that we as a nation would reckon with this horrible illness in this country. So we pray for those in Buffalo and elsewhere who are grieving. And yes, we even pray for the beloved child who perpetrated this violence. We pray for all of those, all of those who have fallen victim to racist ideology in this country. We pray that they will know the comfort of your presence, and we pray, as you promise, the scripture tells us that there will come a day when you wipe every tear from every eye. O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the love made known to us in Jesus Christ through this community and for this congregation, we pray, especially for those who are undergoing and have undergone surgery, we pray for Erica Horn for her upcoming knee replacement surgery this Wednesday. And we pray that it may be a successful procedure and, and a quick recovery. And we pray for those in our congregation who are recovering from surgery. Uh, we pray for our music minister, Wayne, as he recovers from his prostatectomy, and we uh, pray for uh, Richard Schaefer as he recovers from his uh, wrist surgery last week. Be with both Wayne and Richard and with his families uh, on this road to recovery. And for all 
others in and outside of our congregation who need your healing, we pray this day. O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For all who have died, that you will bring them to the fullness of your joy, where mourning and pain will be no more, we pray. O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. And for so many blessings and for answered prayers, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, your beloved child, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, folks, uh, I am told that hopefully next week we are going to resume passing the plate. But for now, we will continue to invite uh, you to, uh, if you feel so called, to leave your offering in the baskets uh, in our narthex, or if you are joining us online on Facebook or YouTube to uh, be directed to our online giving page. So friends, with grateful hearts, let us give of our tithes and our offerings. Gracious God, we give you thanks for these gifts. Bless us with your Holy Spirit, that she may guide us, that we may use these gifts to not hinder the work that you are doing in this world, here and now. This we do in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, our final hymn is number 269, Lead On, O King Eternal.
Friends, we're so glad that you all could join us, that we could gather this day both in person and online to worship God. Hope that you will join us uh, next week, and in the meantime, know how ferociously you are loved by God. So friends, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justice now. Love kindness now. Walk humbly now. We are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are we free to abandon it. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, may all of us, God's beloved children, say, Amen. Go in peace, y'all.